Welcome to Master Gardening. I'm your host, Bud Kwok, and we've got a big show for you today. We've got 12 months worth of show compressed into, into 30 minutes. Yes, we're going to show you how to sow the seeds today, and then we're going to skip ahead a couple months, and then skip ahead a couple months, and skip ahead a couple months, and show you the whole process for tomatoes and peppers. You don't want to miss this one, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome to my formal dining room greenhouse. Yes, this really is a greenhouse right now, and I take this over for about a month every spring to start my seeds. I've got a greenhouse outside, a big one, but it's full of uh, plants that I'm wintering over. I've got fluorescent lights in my, in my uh, garage at, at where I've got trees and shrubs and plants and stuff, and as I move these seedlings into my greenhouse, I move plants out of my greenhouse into the garage. That's my routine. You can have a greenhouse too. Uh, if you've got a heated basement, a heated garage, a utility room, a dining room, <laughs> you just buy fluorescent lights. You don't have to worry about the special lights for, for growing grow lights. Just get the brightest lights you can get for, for fluorescence. There's usually about three or four different categories. Get the bright ones. You don't have to get the bright ones. If you've got bulbs already, they work fine. Uh, keep the lights just above the plants and they'll grow better than they will out in the sunshine. I promise you. You're gonna look at these pepper plants in a minute and you're gonna see how good they, they grow. This is where I start my seeds. You need to think where you're gonna start your seeds. Are you gonna buy seeds? Are you gonna buy plants at the, at the nursery or the box store and then you buy those plants and then put them right directly in the ground? I wouldn't keep them very long after I buy them. Uh, there's a chance you might dry them out or lose some of them. Uh, but if you're gonna, plant seeds for your tomatoes and peppers. Are you going to buy them out of a catalog? Are you going to buy them at the nursery or the box store or both? And that's what I do. In December, I get all these catalogs. <laughs> I get dozens of catalogs in December. I order my seeds the end of December, 1st of January, because I start growing my plants or I sowing my seeds the 1st of February. I've already grown or propagated my peppers and my tomatoes already for the show for purposes but it was about the time maybe a couple a couple days maybe a week earlier than I normally do that okay you've made that decision okay if you look at the catalogs they've got a lot more varieties uh, and I've got these marked peppers and tomatoes if you go to the uh, box stores or the nursery they've got bunches so if you're not really particular you can probably just buy them right there, and sometimes their prices are a little bit cheaper. Um, you can buy a packet of seeds and grow 30 or 40 tomato plants. If you buy, if you bought 30 or 40 tomato plants, the plants they're probably one, two, three. I've even seen four dollars a plant. So that's that's your decision, but that's why I order them out of the catalog, um, the variety and the cost. Okay. You've, we've got we've figured that out. I got my seeds, most of my seeds. I, I order them from different catalogs. Got most of my seeds the end of January. My son also sent me seeds. He's big into hot peppers. Him and his Jamie and his wife Steph out of California. That's they can grow, grow their peppers grow all year long. They don't they don't stop growing. They these had got plants that are a year two years old. Uh, his daughter Katerina and Sasha, their two daughters, they do a lot of the, the growing now. Uh, he orders his seeds, he's into really hot peppers, he orders two packets of each, he sends me half the packets and he keeps half the packets so we can kind of compare and talk about how they're doing and what, how hot they are. And they're so hot that many of them you can't eat, but they're good for show. Okay, how do you plant seeds? Uh, there's a number of different ways. Uh, the, the most common way is, and you notice this is a Tupperware <laughs> this is in Tupperware. This is a little greenhouse. I didn't buy these. You can you get these at the grocery store with ham and turkey and things like that in them. Don't throw them away. They're great. I grilled holes in the bottom of them. Most of the lids you can see through and see if it's, the plants are germinating or not. <clears throat> if you'll notice uh, over here on the table, I've got a bunch of the small seeds. I plant the small seeds early the medium sized seeds a little later and the big seeds I don't plant to almost time to plant them out because they, they, they jump. Uh, 
but if you want to go ahead and here's some seeds right here, I'll show you how I do that. If it's really small seeds, I just sprinkle them on top, don't cover them, and just press them down, make sure they're in contact with the soil, and then put, put them in my little tray right here where I'm going to water them. Make sure they're wet, put the lid on, and they won't dry out until after I've taken the lid off. That'll, that'll stay moist. Okay, we're going to go ahead and put a seed in here. This is a, these are pepper seeds, and they, they, they don't just go on top. You need to cover them a little bit, so just push them down in a little bit, cover them up, blah, 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 and put them on the, in the water. And then, if you want them to grow really fast, you use this heating pad. This is a heating pad made specifically for plants. Seeds like bottom heat. And if you use bottom heat, they'll, they'll either germinate quicker and the, a higher percentage of, uh, of germination. That's about a $40 heating pad. <laughs> I don't suggest you go out and buy one of those. I really don't like them. I've got plenty of time. I just plant them a few days earlier and I get the same results. But I thought it'd be interesting talking about that. Once they germinate, they really don't want the heat, so get them off of there. They like 55, 60, 70 degree weather is even better. Uh, I keep them in here under the lights until the, my greenhouse can be relied on. Uh, it, it, right now, it's between 40 and, and 75 degrees, depending on the sunshine and what have you. I've got some heaters out there, and I can cheat, but that costs money. So I put them in here under here until the greenhouse becomes more acceptable. Okay, that's the normal way people do it, Dan. <laughs> okay, here's a biodome. This is Park's version. It's called a biodome. Oh my goodness, biodome. Sounds very technical. And it's a greenhouse, just like the little greenhouse here. This, this can come off, but it stays on, keeps things moist. And these are like little sponges. Pick one out of here. They really remind me of sponges, but I don't think they are. You, you plant the seed into those, and then you can either, when it, once it germinates, you can take that out and plant the whole darn thing, or you can pull this, and I have done this, just pull the plant off of that and stick it in a, a six pack or whatever you're potting it up to. There's water in the bottom of this, and believe it or not, as it floats on there, these little sponges can soak up that water so it'll never dry out. It's a pretty, pretty ingenious way to do it. You stick the seed right on top of that little sponge. <laughs> okay, there you are. Right on top of there. You can stick it in the hole. If it doesn't go all the way down in the hole, that's fine too. For some reason, it doesn't really matter. Put the lid back on. It'll stay moist until that, and you can really see it. You can see it from 20 feet away whether that's germinated or not. Okay, that's Park Seeds Biodome. And I used that last year and it really worked good. The thing about that is it's a little expensive to buy, but then you can use it over and over and over and over and over. Okay. Then there's one more deal I want to show you. These are called soil blocks. And you get the right you have to have the right mixture. Uh, I, I can tell you it's, it's, it's 16 cups of uh, sifted uh, potting mix. It's, it's six, four cups of compost, a quarter of a cup of green sand, a quarter cup of phosphate powder. And then you stick this little baby here down in there and real hard when it's, well, you, first of all, you've got to put water in it. <laughs> Don't put too much though, because it won't stay together. And then you Sign it out onto the, something like this. And I use this a lot this year. And they say you water this toothpick and it picks up the seed. And you stick that in the little hole right there. You don't have to cover it up, but I do. Okay, and that's, that's how you do these. And it, this is Chick-fil-A, by the way. <laughs> it works out perfect. And this is what my peppers look like this year. These are all sweet peppers. These are all hot peppers. This is the one my son, Jamie, sent me. Okay, and oh, by the way, don't forget to keep things labeled because I have got to this point and found out, oh my gosh, what in the world is that? You pull these babies out of there. 
I've got a better tool to do it than that. Stick it down, water it, it goes to the greenhouse. Okay. That's the whole process. Chick-fil-A, formal dining room, greenhouse. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. Okay, we'll see you in about, I'd say about a month and a half, we'll plant these babies in the ground. Fast forward here at the pepper and tomato patch, two months. It's time to put the tomatoes and peppers into their final resting place. This segment really started last fall, late last fall. We took and put compost on all these beds and tilled, it, tilled the compost in, put shredded leaves on top of the compost. And what that did was really make the earthworms really happy. There were no weeds because of the leaves. Put the leaves on my compost pile, and yes, I live in the city, but I still have a compost pile behind my shrubbery in the front. I, we won't be looking at that today. It's, it's not, not a pretty sight. First thing I do after I take the, the leaves off, I put these, this black fabric on all the beds. The fabric lets the water and the fertilizer go right straight through, just like, just like the, it's, there's nothing there. But it does block the funguses. I live in an area where there's a lot of funguses, and you may not, but before I put the fabric on, I put a layer of fungicide just to be sure. Then when you water your plants, that fungus gets up on the leaves and eventually kills your plant. But because of this fabric, it doesn't do that. It also prevents weeds. I'm low maintenance. I try to be low maintenance. I will never have to weed these beds. If you don't have raised beds, that's okay. If you've, got a, if you've got a long row or however you grow these plants, you can still use the, the black fabric. It warms the soil, and with the raised beds, it drains faster, it, the, the uh, soil warms up faster, so you can plant earlier. Okay, I'm going to quickly go ahead and plant. I've got most of them planted, but I saved one here. Real simple. And by the way, I have soaker hose here. That was a really good idea on paper. I'm not so sure now. And this is going to make it a little more difficult <laughs> without moving the, the cage. I just make a cut an X in the fabric with the scissors. Take my handy dandy trial here. And you can plant these things as deep as you want to because the stems will grow roots. If you've got the stem buried a little bit, roots will grow on the stem. Not so much with peppers. Peppers, you need to plant them at the same level that they were planted at before. I give it a little water. Doesn't take much. The soil's a little bit wet this year. And that's pretty much all there is to it. I'll get that cage out of there. Yeah, that soaker hose. <laughs> I may, may have second thoughts about the soaker hose. Now, I'm a real proponent of cages. Um, it's, a, it's a big job to get these all cut up. I bought one roll of uh, a wire at the uh, at the hardware, and once I made one, I did some measurements, and they went pretty pretty quickly. I have a lineman's pair of pliers to cut this. Uh, it makes it easier. I had I didn't have one to begin with. It's a little hard to cut these things. But once you measure them, you count the squares, and you know exactly how to make all these pretty quickly. Then, if you don't have cages, you can tie them up on stakes. I know my mother liked to do that. She'd tear sheets so the, the, the fabric would not hurt the plant. But uh, I've seen people tie those up before. I ca I, I, cages, I think, are a lot better. T talking about low maintenance again, once the tomatoes and peppers get started, you don't have to worry about them anymore. The cage will take care of them. 
You may have to stuff the limbs in every once in a while during their life cycle to keep them out of your aisles, but that's about the only thing you have to worry about. Uh, if you don't like cages, you can work, you, like I said, you can, you can grow them on trellises, you can grow them on stakes, you can put down straw and let them fall over on the straw. Tomatoes will not stand up on their own, you already know that. Some, some peppers will, but they like to fall over and they get sun scald on the fruit. Okay. okay, that's it for this segment, and uh, we'll see you again in about two months, and these pep tomatoes will be about this tall. We'll see you then. Four months in, this is what the tomatoes and the peppers look like. Now the ones in front here are, are extremely hot. Remember, they're the hottest in the world. They're not as big as the rest of the California Wonders and the different kinds that are just the bell peppers. Good looking plants, right? Good looking plants are not everything. Last year, I experimented with nitrogen. I put lots of nitrogen on both. I found out that was a bad idea. I've got pictures. Pepper plants seven and a half feet tall. Have you ever seen pepper plants seven and a half feet tall? I've never seen them, even in, <laughs> in movies. Same way with the tomatoes, huge. Not a single tomato or pepper. Not a single one until halfway to late in the season and I got a bunch of them. So you wanna hold off on the nitrogen. This year I just used 10, 10, 10, 15, 15, those type of things that are a little bit good in everything. Not that first number is nitrogen, remember? Okay, so the first number, if it's 32, don't put, <laughs> put it on your peppers and tomatoes. Back in the old days, they thought tomatoes were poison. Ha! Guess what? They are. All nightshades, which are peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, and a bunch more, have poison in them. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes not so much. In Macbeth, they, the person was killed with a poison which is a nightshade. That's where it got its reputation. All peppers and tomatoes have a built-in insecticide and fungicide. That, yes, that sounds crazy, but over the thousands of years of evolution, and they need it, believe it or not, because they're very susceptible to funguses. If you have a lower intestinal tract problem, these things are not what you want. If I were you, I would try laying off of nightshades at least for a little while and see if that helps or not. These things are full of vitamin C, they have antioxidants, they will prevent heart problems, they will prevent Alzheimer's, uh, they will help lower your blood pressure, all kinds of good stuff. So don't lay off forever. Now when I walk up and down this aisle, I will stick these things, these tomato stems back up in here because if I don't, they'll get out here and they'll block my aisle. I've got one over here that I missed. I'm probably going to cut it off because sooner or later when it gets a tomato on it, it's going to fall down and be a block to my aisle. Diseases, and this is western Kentucky. You may not have this problem in Arizona, but in Kentucky we have a lot of funguses, a lot of moisture. So they're very susceptible to wilts and blights. So continue, as we talked earlier, with your 10 to 20 day dose of fungicide on both of these. As far as, as animals and pests, peppers are pretty uh, good about not having any. Tomatoes, not so much. They have a worm called a tobacco hornworm, green long one. If you've grown tomatoes very much, you know about them. You see the little excrement on your leaves. You look above and the, and the leaves are skeletonized. Well, here in Western Kentucky, that's not a big problem. I pick them off. You don't have to kill them. Take them to another part of your garden and let them, let them go. Uh, I don't believe in killing bugs unless I have to, so you can pick those off. Leaf miners, thripes, white flies, pep the tomatoes are susceptible to that. Peppers, they aren't. Fast forward about three weeks, tomatoes and the peppers are looking really good. We even got some ripe ones over here. The only thing that's really changed, or hasn't changed, is we're continuing to put the fungicide on the, down on the lower limbs, picking off the really yellow leaves, uh, preventing the fungicide, uh, and we'll continue to do that. 
until we pull the tomatoes because the, here in western Kentucky it's a lot of funguses. You may not be uh, in that area where those are a problem. I'd say in Arizona and Texas you may not have to worry about fungicides but we have to continue to spray every week or two. We'll see you again probably about September and we'll show what, you, what we do next with the harvesting and what to do with these dead plants. They don't look dead yet but <laughs> by the, October they'll look pretty bad. The funguses will get to them. Welcome back. We fast forwarded about six weeks, maybe seven. Tomato plants look a little different. Peppers are a little bit taller, a little bit more fruit on them, but the funguses have hit the tomatoes pretty bad, badly. I don't really care. I didn't spray them as much as I usually do because I had so many tomatoes. I've let them kind of go, and you can see what the damage is. On the other end, it's even worse. Those were better boys down there. These are big beefs. The big beefs are a little bit more resistant. The better boys are really old tomato and they aren't. But you can see the damage done there. One little trick I'll give you up front is you can see this path is kind of blocked with all these vines growing out and what have you. There are no tomato plant tomatoes on these ends of these plants that will ripen before the frost kills them. So just go ahead and cut them off. Clean the aisle out. That puts the energy back into the plant and it'll help the other tomatoes that are maybe going to be in good size for you to pick, it helps them ripen faster. Plus it opens up your aisle. I, I, <laughs> I hate going up and down. There's spider webs this time of year really bad. Okay, it's going to frost tonight. Heavy frost, light frost. In my zone seven, many times we get a frost and then we go two or three or four weeks without a frost. So if you want to extend your growing season, just throw a big, huge piece of plastic over here. I've got some 100 foot by 12 foot if I want to put some on top. But my favorite is just throw a couple old sheets over the top. And if it's just a light frost, that's all it's going to take to save your plants. Maybe you don't want to take a chance. <laughs> I don't like to take a chance. Pick all the tomatoes, all the peppers of size. Even the green ones. This tomato right here, I just put, picked off of there. This will ripen and be a great tomato. The worst tomato out of your patch will be a lot better than the best one you're going to buy at the market. Not the farmer's market, but just the market. Okay, back in the old days, they say wrap this in newspaper, put it in a shoebox, and slide it under your bed, and every couple weeks you take a look at it and see if it's ripe. You don't have to do that. I don't know who came up with that, but that was wrong. You can put it on your table and watch it ripen. That's even better, I think. Okay, so it's going to frost. I'm going to go ahead and do away with my tomatoes and peppers. So what do you do? If you've got cages, I'll show you what to do with my tomatoes. If you've got stakes, just pull them up. If you don't have stakes and they're just laying on the ground, that's even easier. What I will do, I'll cut all these off. Don't forget to pick the good ones. Well, these, were, these vines are really running all twine, intertwined. Okay, you got all that. Next thing you do, pull that tomato plant out of there. That one's a little stubborn. Okay, you remember back when we first put these up, we attached them. So this is all one cage, really. We attached them with these little plastic ties. You're going to have to cut those loose. And don't let them drop down in your bed. Put them in your pocket. And put them in the recycle bin. Pull that cage right out of there. I put my cages behind my greenhouse or behind my shed. Nobody knows the difference. OK. What do you do with these tomato plants? Put them in your compost. <laughs> Dan. <laughs> oh, man. Put them in your compost. No, don't put them in your compost. You get all those diseases. You don't want to supply your compost with a bunch of diseases and wilts and funguses. So throw them in your windrow. Throw them in your creek. Backfield. Throw them in a, in a corner. They'll be de completely decomposed in about six months to a year. So you don't got to worry about them. I live in town. I don't have a backfield. 
enter the dump. You say, I don't like putting stuff in the dump. I don't either. But the dump loves this. Organic matter in the dump makes everything else de decompose better, so the dump likes it, right? And they'll be gone in about, like I said, six months to a year, they'll be completely decomposed. You won't have to worry about it. <laughs> well, that went really well. Okay. I'm out of breath. Uh, not many more to go. I'm almost done. No. On the bottom of this, we put down, if you remember, we put down a fabric, a black fabric. I think I got a piece over here. Put down this black, what are you going to do with that? Well, you tear it up. It's got staples in it, so you're going to keep the staples and recycle the staples for next year. Throw it in trash, throw it in a dump, put new down next year. I wouldn't do that. Take that out. It's just as good as the day you put it down there. It's a little dirty. Spit it down on your yard. Take a garden hose. Wash it all off. Roll it up. And guess what? That will fit you right on your tomato bed or pepper bed next year. It's the right size, right? Especially if you've got raised beds like I do. And even better than that, it's got the holes cut for the plants with the exact perfect spacing. So you don't have to go get down your hands and knees and cut those holes again. So. You can go ahead and it's your choice, but that's put a little work in this, this time of year and it saves you a lot of work next year. Well, that's it for our tomatoes and peppers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, everything going well here. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's the end of our tomatoes and peppers and it's also the end of our tomatoes and peppers show. So this is Master Gardening. I'm your host, Bud Quok. And until next time, good gardening. Mm -hmm.